Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image of in the form of corruptible man or birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts, receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to depraved mind, to do the things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. We want to finish looking this morning at, at Romans chapter 1, and we will backtrack and review a bit because I have new thoughts in relation to some of the things we've already covered, but we will finish through the rest of this chapter, hopefully this morning. And it's really an uncomfortable chapter, really, because it deals with the issue of sin, and sin is not something comfortable for us to talk about. And I was just thinking through this issue in regards to the world that surrounds us. And there's several things we can come to understand about sin, but one of the things, you know, we're introduced to several terms in the in New Testament, even the Old Testament, that deal with the issue of sin, and they tell us different things about sin. One of the ones that we are familiar with in dealing with sin is hamartia, which is dealing with missing the mark. And this talks about the nature of sin, if you will, its character. And there are other things that we encounter in, in the Greek text that tell us about this nature or character of sin, but... We will get into this when we get to chapter 3, verse 23, but this is where we come to that all have sinned, miss the mark, and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I'll just tell you, oftentimes we think miss the mark is sort of something that happened accidentally, right? In other words, man was aiming at the right target, he just happened to miss a little bit to one side or the other. That's not the meaning of this term. The meaning of the term is that they have missed the target because they have aimed at the wrong target, Okay? There is culpability. There is responsibility. And that's one of the things about sin we really don't like. We don't like the fact that we're responsible. Okay? But the, the diagnosis of God is that all have sinned. Not some, not a few, but everyone has sinned. Right? And therefore all stand condemned before God. And I know it's a difficult thing for us to grasp, and it's not a pleasant topic to talk about. It's not easy, especially in our day. And there's several things that really hinder us. And I would hope that as we've looked at this passage, it will start for you to help you develop your, if you will, your doct doctrine of homartiology, your doctrine of sin. Because it's a crucial doctrine. And it's crucial even in how we do ministry and how we reach out to people and the things that we say. But here's some of the misconceived ideas or some of the things that make this understanding of this doctrine difficult for us, especially in relation to our society. The first is this, that sin is not a pleasant topic. I mean, it's the same as like death. I mean, we really don't like to talk about it, but the, the issue of the fact is it's a reality. It's always fascinating to me, you know, when we understand the biblical diagnosis of man, why any of us are really surprised at the thing that, things that man does, right? I mean, it's interesting because Ian and I, we, we've sat and talked about this at one time because we were watching a show, and it was interesting because someone had done something against the law, and it seemed so heinous or whatever, and you would sit there and go, well, I just can't, how can so-and-so do a thing like that? But see, if we know man and his nature then we would say, well, of course, right? He's acting according to his sinful nature. It's really not a surprise. But it's really a depressing topic to talk about sin because the reality of it is when we talk about sin, we have to acknowledge that we are sinners, right? And that we are guilty and that our lives are polluted 
And although we may not say it, we really do act like we're good people. I mean, just think about it. How oftentimes we hear that, oh, she's a good person. She's a great neighbor, right? Oh, he's a good guy. I mean, he, yeah, he did this, but he's really a good guy. See, we, we constantly impose this goodness on man when really there's no goodness there in man, right? Man is condemned before God. And we don't acknowledge the sin nature. Sin is a negative teaching, not agreeable with society's emphasis on being positive. Just think about this. There is a movement in society today that insists on positive mental attitude, accentuating only positive ideas and considerations, right? How many times have we heard within society, i got to think positive, think positive, think positive. Now it's okay as a believer to think positive. In other words, we are optimistic because of the hope and all that we have. But outside of our relationship to Christ, there is no positiveness about it, right? But i got to think positive. i got to think good, right? Everything's positive. So to speak about man as a sinner is almost screaming an obscenity or profanity in society. You can't say that about him or her. You can't call them a sinner. You can't say that they're wrong. Right? We can't even do that nowadays. We can't call sin, sin. It's interesting because I remember Kobe Bryant, when he was coming out, he had committed adultery. Right? Slept with a young woman in a hotel when he was off, cheated on his wife. And it was interesting because when he was making his confession publicly on the news, he said, I committed the act of, or I made the mistake of, and fortunately, he used the word adultery, which was good, because oftentimes in society we say, oh, she or he had an affair, right? We just sort of smooth it over. We try to make it all nice and positive. We use gentle terms, right? We don't want to offend. You see, the general attitude today is it's a new kind of legalism. And there's the prohibition, thou shalt not speak anything negative, right? This will crush man's self-esteem. You can't call him or her a sinner because it's going to destroy their self-esteem and you're going to break them down. But see, in order to build up, you have to dig down. When you build a solid, strong house, you have to lay a foundation. You dig down, you set a foundation, and then you have something solid to build on. Without digging deep, there's no going up. But see, in society today, you can't say negative things. Sin is a foreign concept for some people. Some view the problem society is stemming from an unwholesome environment rather than sinful humans, right? If we just change the environment, then everyone's behavior would be good. It's not the environment, right? It's the sinful nature of man. And we can't accept the reality of guilt either. I mean, this is difficult for us to accept. And there's several influences for this. One of them is Freud in his thinking, in psychology, right? And he suggested that guilt was an irrational feeling that one ought not to have. It's a wrong-mindedness, if you will. And the reason for this is because if there is no God, then the only one that you're accountable is to yourself and to others. And if you don't hurt anybody else, then it's okay. And you're ridiculous for feeling guilty. See, how many times do we hear that? See, if it's in my own home and in the confines of my own bedroom and no one else is being hurt, it's okay. It's not sin. No, what you do in the confines of your own home and in your own bedroom, whether anyone sees it or is hurt by it or not, it is sin if God says it's sin, right? But see, we know, we hear all this stuff all the time. That's why it's so important for us to develop a doctrine of homartiology, a doctrine of sin, to be sound in our understanding of this because we need to know how to encounter the world. And it needs to be biblically shaped. We need to have a Christian worldview, right? Not a secular worldview. So therefore, if no one's actions, if my actions don't hurt anybody, then it's fine and I don't have to feel guilty. But that's just wrong-mindedness when it comes to the Word of God. Sin is objective and not subjective. Some can speak of sinful acts, but not sinful nature. In other words, they cannot grasp the idea of an innate force, an inherent condition, or a controlling power within man. They can't grasp a sin nature, but they don't mind talking about wrongful acts. They don't mind talking about acts of sin, 
Okay, but they only express them in concrete things, right? These are things that so-and-so did. Now, if you remove those things from that person, then they are good. So then if I don't do something wrong to somebody, if I don't beat someone over the head with a stick or something, or if I don't steal from them, then I am good then. So then all of a sudden, all that sin is is just that act. It's not a disposition. Scripture says in Romans 7 that we are born inherently with a sin nature. It's not just the acts themselves, it is our condition as man. We need to be clear on that. Because the reality of it is, if man's good, there's no need for a gospel, right? There's no need to share with him about Jesus Christ. And there was no point for him coming, and no point for him dying on the cross, and it was all completely in vain, and it was all worthless, and it was for naught. But the reality is, is that it was necessary. And it's interesting because even our doctrine of sin, it affects our, our view of God because, you know, when we think about God, some people, you know, when you talk to them, the reality is that they, when you listen to them speak, they talk about God as like he's some grandfather, right, up in heaven. Or if I can take the analogy a little bit further, that God is sort of like this grandfather that lives in another state. And occasionally I go to visit him. See, when things are really tough in my life and they're really extreme, then I go talk to him. But otherwise, I just don't see him and I don't communicate with him. And occasionally he gives me a gift, although he's probably giving me gifts all the time. But I only acknowledge the ones that are really important to me, see? And if this is my view of God, he's that lovable grandfather. No matter how bad I am, he's always going to love me, see? Then sin isn't that big of a deal. However... If I understand God according to Romans chapter 1, that He is eternal in power and divine, that He is infinite and transcendent, that He is holy purity and absolute righteous in everything that He does, that there is no error or sinfulness or evilness within Him, that He is pure by nature and by being, then all of a sudden what happens to sin? It becomes a very serious problem. And that's a biblical view of sin. It's a serious problem and it has to be dealt with. So I, I take you to Romans chapter 1, and we've talked about the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We began to look at the dreadful consequences of deliberate atheism, and it is deliberate as Paul presents it here. I give you another thought to plant in your minds. To rebel against God's self-revelation nature is to incur the results of that rebellion. If man suppresses the truth about God or continues to push away the reality of God's existence, there's going to be trouble. And that's what Romans 1 tells us as we started to look at it. So we saw the condemnation of the heathen world. Everyone stands condemned. He begins with anthropon as he talks about the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, verse 18. So he embraces everyone. Everyone is culpable. And we might look at the sins that are listed here and we'll talk about them. We'll talk about lesbianism and homosexuality. And I'm sorry if there's someone here who doesn't want to hear about those things. They can go when we get to that point. But if we're going to understand these things and realize these kinds of things, we may not say, well, well, I'm not guilty of that. I don't do anything deviant. My sexual behavior doesn't mean that you're not sinful. Because if you look at the rest of the sins listed in verses 28 and following, I guarantee every single one of us has hit, hit us somewhere in our life. And we are culpable of them somewhere. Even verse 25. For they have exchanged the truth of God for lie and have worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. We are all guilty of self-deification. We are. We probably don't want to admit to it, but we do it. And we still struggle with it, even as believers. There are times when we self-deify ourselves. We exalt ourselves and put ourselves on the throne and remove God. If we're true and honest with ourselves before the Word of God, we do this. We do this. The wrath of God is being revealed. This is a present tense. is continuously being revealed and anticipates God's final withdrawal from those who do not respond to His love. And I love this in chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you not think lightly the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads to repentance? There's a chance for repentance. This judgment that He talks about, and God gave Him over, God gave Him over, God gave Him over, this is not final. The final wrath comes, chapter 2, verse 5, in another day. Listen to me. If the handing over in verses 24, 26, and 28 were not if you will, present, and, and they were dealing with future handing over, then there's no need for Paul to talk about in chapter 2, verse 5, this future day of judgment or the wrath of God. There's pointless. Okay, So when he talks about the handing over, this is not final. There's still hope. That's why we share the gospel with people. There's still hope for them to be saved. The judgment isn't final, but it's going to be final. There's going to come a day. I just suggest to you, too, that even when we look at these words, the statements for handing over, handing over, they're all looking aorist tense, all right? 
If Paul was going to say that these were final acts of judgment by God, he would have used the perfect tense. They stand in the state of being handed over. It's complete. It's done. The results continue on, not to be changed. The other thing that's interesting, in chapter 8, he uses the same expression in relation to the Son who is handed over to death. Same form, everything, same word. Well, if Jesus was handed over to death and it was a permanent handing over, then he didn't rise from the dead, right? But he did. So understand that when he talks about the judgment here, it's not final, but it's leading to that final one. So there is hope. We also talked about the fact that the lack of reverence for God leads to a lack of justice for people. So he deals with, I mean, this is the Decalogue, right? The first commandment's given in relation to our relationship to God. The next are given in relationship to man. The one flows right from the other. And to forsake God then which leads to a forsaking of his creatures. I mean, just think about this atheism, right? As soon as you remove God from the picture, I mean, just think about it. I mean, that's the natural outcome. The national policy then would be grinding people under the collective heel, if you will, whatever is best for society. But see, when you remove God from the picture, we've got a big problem. Big problem. The only reason why we're in the state that we are in in America is because it was founded on a belief in God. And we have been preserved by that belief. We remove that and we're in big trouble. Big trouble. And just watch the progressiveness. We're moving towards socialism, right? It's built on atheism. So as we move towards socialism, we keep moving God out of the way. We take him out of schools. You can't pray. You can't do this. You can't do that. Eventually, he's going to take in God we trust off the dollar bill and everything else that we do and all the songs that we sing and all the belief that we had as a nation. When that's moved, we're moving towards socialism. And now, all of a sudden, we're going to go to communism and it's all over with, right? It's just the way we're going. The wrath of God is very deserved. It's, it's not something that God does arbitrarily, but it's deserved. And the first thing is for suppressing His truth. The second part of verse 18, and I, I did not give you this thought before, but I just give it to you now. Truth can be held down, suppressed, and stifled, but it cannot be changed. Reason being is in chapter, two, chapter 1, verse five, we'll talk, 25, we'll talk about this. Verse 25 of chapter 1, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Now some ha have said, well, they have, they have changed the truth into a lie. No, you can't change truth. You can't change it. You can hold it down. You can suppress it. You can stifle it. But you can't change truth. Verse 25, he's not talking about changing something into something else. He's talking about substituting one thing for another. It's an exchange, not a change. I'll give you an example. That projector right there is an absolute. If I'm an atheist, I, have, I can't accept that. It's not there and whatever else. It's an absolute. Now, as an atheist, I can turn my back to that projector and I can shuffle around it so I don't have to look at it and suppress the reality of its being there. Or I can walk past it and look the opposite direction so I don't have to look on it and there where I suppress it again and I deny the reality of its existence as an absolute. Or I can look at it and I can reason in my mind that it's a nice fluffy cloud, but as soon as I pick it up and drop it on my toe and I'm brought to the reality of its substance, its true substance, I have to acknowledge the fact it's an absolute. This is what man does. I can't change the truth. I can suppress it. I can stifle it. But I can't change it. Man keeps trying to push it down, but he cannot push it down. Sometimes to suppress the truth and the, the voice of truth and reason, he dives deeper into his sinfulness to escape. Sometimes he tries to reason out of it. Sometimes he objects to it, but nonetheless he cannot change it. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. When we know we have the truth, why should we be ashamed, right? So often we're afraid to share with people because, you know, what we find from the world and its influence upon us is we're led to think that this isn't truth and there aren't absolutes and everything's relative. We have the truth. It's absolute. It doesn't change. It's final. It's in God's nature. It's manifested from Him. Therefore, we don't have to be ashamed of it. And we should be freely sharing it with others. The other reason for God's wrath being manifest is the ignorance, the ignoring of God's revelation. Things visible, they demand a power invisible that brought them into existence. I mean, the reality that matter has always existed, it's impossible to a logical mind. It's impossible. And when we look at physics and the fact that nature and all that surrounds us, it's time, it's, if you will, it's in a clock, it's going down, it's not going up, it's not eternal, it's coming to its demise, and therefore it had to start somewhere. It's illogical, but remember, we're dealing with non-believers, those who say there is no God, the psalmist says, they are unreasonable and illogical. That's why it's sort of absurd for us to use logical reasoning to try to explain to them the existence of God, because they don't think that way. 
And especially in this passage, it reveals that man is bankrupt when it comes to his thinking and reasoning. The other reason for God's wrath being poured out is for perverting God's glory, verses 21 through 23. And we started to look at this last week. We'll look at it a bit more fully, but he says from verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. I mean, the glorification of God and giving thanks to Him, this is really, if you will, this is the soul's duty to God's revelation within nature. And yet we don't do that. It's the natural inclination of man, and this is what God expects as a result of His revelation in nature. He revealed it for a purpose, and this is to be the result of that. Right In everything, God is to be glorified, whether in the natural realm or the spiritual realm. God is to be glorified, and when we don't do that, and we move God from the picture then, we get further and further into our darkness. God gives to all the basic requirements of life irrespective of their relationship to Him. He provides for everybody. He causes the rain to fall on the wicked as well as the unwicked, right? On the righteous and the unrighteous. But people choose to ignore God and they come up with their own version of reality, which is not reality, right? I mean, if God is truth, God is reality, we remove God, there's no truth, there's no reality. It's as simple as that. That's why it's crazy to me, you know, when we move God from all the decisions we make in life and, and all the things that we face in life and our reasoning about life, so often we push God off to the side and we try to reason through our circumstances and situations and make decisions without God in the picture. It's crazy to me. How can we be sure we're making the right choice? How can we be sure we're even being reasonable and thinking in reality when we're not connected to the one who is reality? And then we wonder why, man, why did my decisions go so bankrupt? Why did they fall apart? Why did not my plans work out? Because we did not roll them unto the Lord. And we did not acknowledge Him in all of our ways. So the reality of this in verse 21, that once a man has fallen from his true relation to God, he is no longer capable of truly rational thought about God. Their speculations became futile. Their reasonings, if you will, they are foolish. Their foolish heart was darkened. It's interesting, Ephesians, we saw this, chapter 4, verse 17, when Paul talks about the Gentiles, do not live like the Gentiles live, and the futility of their mind, and he says in verse 18, who stand in the state of being darkened. That's the condition of man without the enlightenment of Christ. They stand in the state of being darkened. In a moral universe, it's impossible to turn from the truth of God and not suffer consequences. Remember the one brother asked me in Russia, he asked me, how come we're so unhappy here when I see Americans smiling because you live in a land that was based on atheism? You disconnect God and there's all kinds of trouble. In other words, sin inevitably results in darkening of some aspect of our human existence. It just does. And it still affects us this way. Do you understand that? It still affects us this way. We have sin in our life then our reasoning is not going to be all that it should be. And our thinking and our ability to look at situations is not going to be the same when we have sin in our life. And the same thing goes with relationships. And then we wonder why they're so bad. It's interesting because he makes this statement. This is the first one. Verse 23, he says, And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image in the form of corruptible man, the birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. This is the first statement of this exchange that comes. But just notice this. They exchange the immortal for the mortal. They exchange that which is not subject to decay or death to that which is subject to decay and death. Just think about that. From the absurdity of the exchange. But see, we're doing this, and we do this in our life. We go to man rather than God, the nation of Israel. God punished them. Why? Because they kept running to foreign forces to be their aid and to deliver them and save them. And God says, here I am. Here I am. Excuse me, <laughs> I stand over all of this and outside all of this. Do you realize that our God never changes? He can't mutate. Isn't that beautiful? Our God cannot mutate in His character. It's, a, it's contrary to His nature. We change all the time, most of the time for the worse. Hopefully more than, than often to the words better, but most of the time for the worse. But do you know God doesn't change. He's not corrupt. He can't die. His existence is rooted in His very nature. He is the existing one. Why would we exchange that? 
for that which is given over to corruption and decay. It's insane. Three exchanges that are talked about here. Verse 23, the immortal for the mortal. The truth of God for the lie. And it is the lie. It's not a lie. It's the lie. In the Greek, it's an article. The lie. Not only that, but they have exchanged the natural for the unnatural. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And the same for the men as well. We're lousy at exchanges. For human beings, the things that we give over, and we think that we make such great decisions, and Paul says, ah, it's rooted in your nature. So verse 23, they've exchanged the one who exists outside of creation, not subject to inevitable demise, for that which is at this very moment caught in the process of decay. Why for the future would you cling to that which falls apart? I mean, it's, I mean you look at the fallibility of man, and we all know that. If we watch the news, we know that man is a sinner, that man's a reprobate. Why would we cling to the things of man then for answers? And we can sit and say poo-poo on the rest of the world and pronounce judgment on them, but we do the same things, don't we? Do we not do the same things? The exchange indicates in the awful ignorance of fallen humanity. They just don't understand. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, God had prohibited the Israelites from making images similar to ones that Paul lists here. And he gives them almost exactly. There's some variation, but you notice the decline in verse 23. Notice the movement that goes from the incorruptible God all the way down to the end of verse 23. Notice the crawling creatures, the things upon the ground. In other words, when we talk about the debased mind, it naturally gravitates to the lowest possible level. Now, we can look at some of our neighbors and say, well, they're not as degenerate as so-and-so over here, or we're not all like Charles Manson, but we all have the propensity to go that way. And the more that we eradicate God from our life, the further down in the hole we go, the worse we become. That's why it's interesting. When we have problems in life, whether it's relationships or whatever it is, the first place we ought to go is where? God. God. Because when He's not in the picture... There is no true resolution to the problem. And in all problems, we have to be willing to acknowledge the fact that we are sinful. And we don't like to do that. And the reality is, as human beings, we don't like to talk about sin. And we always discuss, I mean, go back to Genesis 3. We're all hiding behind the fig leaf. And we keep doing that, right? We have all different kinds of fig leaves that we try to hide our shame and guilt behind. We even cover up our own sin by someone else's sin. Well, so-and-so did this to me, so therefore I do that to them. They do this to me, and I withhold this from them. Two wrongs do not make a right. But see, we're always hiding behind the fig leaf. Because we don't want to face who we are. And the more that we don't do that, the worse off we become. Luther noted four steps in perversion. He started off with ingratitude, then vanity, then blindness, and then total departure from God. It's such a bleak picture, isn't it? But this is the progression of man. Lest they hear the gospel. Lest they hear. And they will not hear, Paul says in, in Romans chapter 10, they will not hear if we do not what? If we do not tell them. Then we let them go upon, not their merry way, but their way of demise. The wrath of God being inflicted. Notice with me, verse 24. Therefore God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored, if you will, among them. This goes back all the way back to verse 18, to the wrath being outpoured. It embraces everything in between. This is God's response to it all. God is inflicting His wrath upon mankind. And we have this threefold refrain. It comes in verse 24, God gave them over. Verse 26, notice with me, God gave them over. Verse 28, and God gave them over. These are deliberate acts by God. Just understand that these are deliberate acts by God. Active voice in the verb. And each of these convey a judicial action on the part of God, but they're not final eternal punishment. They are a present judgment, yes, but they're not final. There's still hope. There's hope for change. And when we look at the depravity of man in some of these statements that are given here, we still need to understand there's still hope. 
And we need to offer them that hope. The first thing he abandons them to a depraved heart. And notice how everything comes from within. Notice with me, he deals with the issue in the lust of their heart. He, he hands them over to impurity so that, notice, that their bodies may be dishonored among them. Sin permeates everything of the human being, the totality of man. It permeates everything. That's total depravity. So God gave them over to their sin and the consequences that are inflicted because of their sin. So even the consequences of sin is an act of judgment of God on mankind. Right? All the things that they face. I give it to you this way, written in wisdom literature, one is punished by the very things by which he or she sins. In other words, sin creates its own penalty. God forgives the sin, but it doesn't mean He removes the consequences of our sin. Sometimes we think as believers that when God forgives us, even the consequences aren't going to be there. That's not so. That's not so. And we don't have a biblical view of this doctrine if we think that way. So God may forgive my past sin, but the consequences can still be there. I still feel things physically because of things that I did in my sinful past. And God didn't take them away from me. So I'm shamefully reminded every single day of my depravity. But we all are. Even in our relationships, the things that we do in the relationship, and then it comes back on us and we realize, well, what happened? Well, we did this. We did this. Paul says that in the lust of their heart, God did this. He handed them over to their impurity. Even the human heart is fatally inclined toward that which is evil. This is the, the wicked disposition of man. The statement to impurity, and, and it may be misunderstood by some people, but this is always talking about sexual impurity, if you will. And then he gives a statement that their bodies would be dishonored and degraded among themselves. I mean, look at the things that he talks about with lesbianism and homosexuality. He now becomes very specific. He's just talking generally here in verse 24. He's going to become specific in verses 27 and 28. But this is the general overall idea of what's going on. So then by practicing these, device, or these vices that he lists in verses 26 and 27, men and women are actually degrading their own bodies. They're using them for things that God did not intend them to be used for. And when we talk about the absurdity of, of not understanding and realizing, I mean, just the, the clearness of a man to be with a woman, that's natural. That's, that, I mean, it's so evident. How can you not see that? But see, in the darkness of a sin, we don't see that. But see, the church is capitulating on this, folks. They really are. Just recently, there was a pastor who was asked to step down from, he was asked to do the, the presidential breakfast prayer. There was a watch group that found out that 15 years ago he preached a message on homosexuality that's a sin, but you can be delivered it by the power of Jesus Christ. And when they found that out, they forcefully asked him to step down. And he did. But he did it in such a way in which he just sort of pushed this aside like this is a non-issue instead of taking his stand and saying, but Scripture is clear on this and this is where I stand. I have to stand here. The church is capitulating all over the place with this issue. We're feeling the pressure of the world upon us. And the church is giving in instead of standing for the truth. Listen to me. If we truly love the sinner, right? If we truly love them, we will tell them the truth. We do them no favor from hiding this. I mean, if there's something flaw, flawed in my, in my child's character, and I don't tell my child about that flaw so that they can fix it and become better, I really don't love them, do I? If I let them to continue on in this state, we are to tell the truth in love. Yes? We don't have to be brutal, but we have to be honest. And sometimes that honesty can be brutal, but it's not us. It's the Word of God saying this is the way it is. It's natural. So our bodies then are meant for better and more, more profitable things than what we use them for. And we disgrace them. We disgrace them, we dishonor them, and we reject God. And we give them over to things that are not to be given over to. It's just the fact of it. God has also abandoned them to depraved passions. So now he moves into particular. Verses 26 and 27. They've exchanged that which is natural for that which is unnatural. It's just amazing to me from this passage that there's just there's even debate in the church about this. This is one of the clearest passages on lesbianism and homosexuality in all of, all of the New Testament. You can go to 1 Corinthians 6 if you want to. It's pretty clear on the issue. And you can say, well, don't be judgmental. Don't be a hater. Well, 
you're a hater if you reject the truth. You're a God hater, right? And all we're trying to do is say, this is the truth and this is what God says and this is the way it ought to be. So Paul describes he practices. This is Paul giving God's diagnosis of these kinds of practices. Understand this. This is what God says about it. This is not Steve's opinion. This is not my view, although it is now my view, right? Because it's God's view. Understand, this is what Paul says. It's degrading. It's unnatural. It's against nature. It's indecent. It's shameless. It's error. And this term error, we can sort of soften it up in English, but that's not what it is. It's completely wrong behavior. It is perversion. That's how God defines it. I might be uncomfortable with saying that, but that's the reality of it, right? It's the truth. It's just the way it is. And it's interesting because when Paul writes this in Rome, Rome was someone, they, they embraced everything. The Romans, they tolerated homosexuality with great ease. They embraced it. Even at times they held it in great honor. I give you this statement from William Barclay. He made the statement, 14 out of the first 15 Roman emperors were homosexuals. Suetonius, who was a Roman biographer and historian, he wrote from A.D. 69 around that period, he remarks that Julius Caesar was every woman's man and every man's woman. This was the empire. This permeated the empire, right? It goes from the top down. If this is what the leaders are doing, just imagine what the people are doing. It was acceptable. It was okay. And some would like to suggest that the homosexuality and that and lesbianism that existed in that day is a lot different than our day. Or that there's two different kinds of homosexuality, right? There is the right kind and then there is the wrong kind. It's just one kind and it's wrong. I, I, that's just how it is. It's what God says. For the Jews, though, at this time and at any time, really, they regarded this as an abomination in culture and they could not accept it whatsoever. And I give you the statement by Barrett, no feature of pagan society filled the Jew with greater loathing than the toleration or rather admiration of homosexual practices. Leviticus, it condemns it, right? And it also gives the penalty of death for both who partake in it. That's how God sees this. Not man sees this in his depravity, but how God sees this in his holiness and righteousness and purity. If he created the universe, then he's the one who tells us how it is to function. If he designed and instituted marriage, then he's the one who tells us how it is to be. But how often even we as believers run away from that, don't we? We know what our roles are as husband and wives. We know what we're supposed to be doing, and yet we turn a blind eye to it because we don't like it. But God says, this is the way I created it. This is how it's supposed to be. You can either suppress that truth, reject that truth, try to stifle that truth, but guess what? It's still the truth, and it stands. The kind of life described in verses 26 through 27, then there is no way that we can consider this as an alternative lifestyle that is acceptable to God. There's no way, and I don't understand this, how, how Christian teachers and preachers can look at this passage and say anything other than what's here. It's crazy to me how they can embrace the terminology of the world. It's an alternative lifestyle. It's okay with God if you live this way. It's not okay with God. It's not how He meant it to be. We need to, if we are loving and if we understand that we are obligated to those whom Christ died for, if we are obligated to them, Paul says in chapter 1, verse 14, then we are obligated to tell them the truth. We do them no good when we turn a blind eye to this and when we walk away from it and we skirt around it and we choose to be like them and not look at the absolute in front of us. We serve them no good in their life when we let them to go into their way of degeneration. And the responsibility lies with us because we know the truth, do we not? We're culpable then when we don't offer the truth. The amazing thing is that the Word of God and the Gospel, it has power, 116. It is the power of God unto salvation. Transformation can come. Listen to me. If transformation is not possible, then there's no point in preaching a Gospel. It's amazing that God brought this one brother into my life some years back and he gave me a chance to disciple him. If you looked at him today, you would never know he came from a homosexual background. God had so radically transformed his life with the gospel, 
and he is now living and serving the Lord faithfully in church along with his wife and children. The power of the gospel is enough to change man's nature from sinner to saint. It's possible. The problem is we listen to the world and we say it's not possible. It's just who they are. They can't change. Yes, they can change. But they can't change man's way by just changing the environment. Passing laws is not enough. The gospel is enough. If we don't believe that, then what are we doing? Then what are we doing? The sexual drive is a wholesome thing. It's a good thing. It's God's way of giving pleasure and progeny, procreation, right? We celebrate the coming of a new life this morning with us in fellowship. What a blessed gift that God has given us in that. But we pervert it. So when it's directed toward a person of the same sex, it abandons its God-given purpose and it becomes a degrading passion. We just have to call it for what it is because that's what God says it is. Lastly, he abandons them over to a depraved mind. In verses 28 through 32, there's a listing of things that he deals with here, but let me just explain this. This is a general statement, a depraved mind. This is a mind that is unable to think with any clarity about moral issues. All right? This is man. So in other words, one's ability to think clearly about moral issues is undermined by his depravity. So then why would we listen to any kind of sinful, secular human being to tell us about morality and ethics? Why would we do that, right? The absurdity of it, but yet we do. In other words, God's will and ways with humans is crucial factors in understanding the moral world in which we live. It's crucial. But here's the problem. With secular education, it's seriously flawed. Why? Because it attempts to look at the whole without acknowledging the most crucial part, and that is God. It's why as homeschool parents, we are trying to give our children a Christian education, a God-oriented education, because we want them to see the world as it truly is. God is in everything. And when the world tries to take God out, then they're trying to look at the whole and make sense of it all, and they can't because they have removed the most crucial part, and that is God Himself. He created the moral universe. Therefore, He is the one who dictates what happens in it and how it's to function. I pray that we are all impassioned by these truths because we need to be. The problem is with the church in America has not been impassioned by these truths for a long time and it's in a sorrowful state today. Not impassioned to the point that we are belligerent but impassioned to the point that we stand for them, we speak out about them, we hold to them with great conviction and we don't let go. Because see, as parents, folks, the way this world is going, this nation is going, if we're not doing this and setting this example for our children, guess where our children are going to be? They need to see in us standing for the absolute truth and not budging. For clinging to God, not to man. To looking to God's ways, not man's ways. This is what they need to see. Because the reality of it is, the things that they are going to face when they grow up and for their children are going to be worse than what we are facing now. We need to prepare them for what is to come. And it's coming. There's no doubt about it if we read everything correctly. And I don't have to be that intelligent, and I'm not, to see what's coming. These things that Paul lays out, he says, to do those things which are not proper, verse 28. God has given them over because they did not fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And this seems really sort of insignificant, those things which are not proper. And it seems like very weak terminology, but look at the things that he lists. And he gives us a series of things, negative qualities that mark sinful nature. I'm going to just walk quickly through them. We have, if you will, divided up into three parts. You can go back and look at my sermon later to get these all right but he breaks them up very nicely for us into groups and they're done grammatically and so on but just walk through some of these together okay he starts off with this filled with all unrighteousness the lack of moral uprightness this is the umbrella statement for things that are to come verse 29 being filled up with all kinds of unrighteousness we all are we not be given to the moral depravity, the sexual depravity in verses 26 and 27, but understand this, we still are morally depraved. We are. And we still fight that conflict, don't we? 
with sin nature? Romans 7, right? Paul says, in my heart I want to do, and in the heart I want to do, but in the flesh, right, I don't do. We still contend. But here's the things he lays out. We can think, well, I don't fall under the umbrella here of depravity. Well, absolutely we do. Greed, the first one. And I'm not going to cover all of them. The insatiable desire to have more normally at the disadvantage to others. We manifest greed in so many different ways. And so often we just associate it with Wall Street <laughs> and finances. No, greed is manifested in many different ways. Many different ways. It is an insatiable desire to have more normally at the disadvantage to others. It's always to our advantage. It is. Envy. This reminds us that secular society is not just one happy band of brothers. It's not. There's envy. Right? I mean, anytime we look at what someone has and goes, oh man, ah, oh man, just stepped into the green zone. Envy. Just do, right? You look at your neighbor next door. I wish I had. Man, I can't. You know, we set our eyes on it. We start looking upon it. We want it. We covet. It's when the Ten Commandments, right, goes deeper than just the surface. Man, it digs down to the, the heart. Envy. Malice. Aristotle put it this way. The tendency to put the worst construction upon everything. Goodsby put it ill nature. Grunman describes it as conscious, intentional wickedness. We see this in society. We see this all around us. We watch the news. It's there. Slanders. Phillips put it this way. Stabbers in the back. I like this. We do this in the church. We do. We slander. We gossip. We stab each other in the back. If we're honest, right? Haters of God. We may not think so. We may not think so. But sometimes if we really evaluate our actions and the things that we do, pragmatically we may be. I mean, you think about it. I mean, there's, there's dogmatic atheists and there's pragmatic atheists, those who just live like there is no God. Do you know sometimes we do that, right? We do and act and make decisions as though God's not even there. Insolent contains a mixture of cruelty and pride. I'm sure some of us are culpable of that, if not all. Arrogance. Those in their self-sufficiency elevate themselves over others, really. And it just leads, notice what follows it, verse 30. Arrogance and then boastful. The one follows the other. Naturally, it's going to. I mean, just think about this. How many times do we act like we're self-sufficient? I was just thinking about this in regards to things that we do. You know, you could learn a trade, a skill from somebody, right? And you learn it from them. And you made all your mistakes in the beginning, and they, but they taught you. And you learned how to do it, and then now you walk on, right? But somehow we forget we learned it. <laughs> and we were not self-sufficient, but we got it from somebody else, right? We received it. And then all of a sudden we're at this end of it and we act like everyone else around us is an idiot. Why don't you know this? Right? You're a moron. Right? Because we forget we're not self-sufficient. We all achieve it and, and get to it from somewhere else, right? And then we treat others like idiots and... This is the sin nature. Inventors of evil. We're ingenious at our evil and our sinfulness. We are. We're ingenious at how we get back at people who do us wrong. We're ingenious at our deceptiveness. It's good to be ingenious, but not in this way. We are without understanding. And I think the New Jerusalem Bible translates this without brains. <laughs> we, we are. We're without brains. Untrustworthy. This is interesting. Those who are false to their word. It's made up of an alpha privative plus a preposition soon and the word tithe meet a place. And it designates those who do not keep a covenant. In other words, it is that which has been put in place with another. And if we evaluated this last week, maybe some of us have uh, fallen short on this this last week, you think? Untrustworthy. We don't stand behind our word. Unloving, without natural affection. How about unmerciful? We don't show pity. It's interesting because, you know, we, we do this. We don't. We don't show that natural affection of love, and it's just to be natural within the family context or otherwise. But what about pity? Now, some can say that I'm pitiless when it comes to my children when they get hurt. Not so. I know my children. 
See, we know our kids, when they fall, they get hurt, they look to us, right? And oftentimes they don't respond until they look at us and then we go, oh, are you okay? And then all of a sudden they burst into tears. Well, not really hurt, they're okay. And those are times we need to stand them up and say, come on, let's get going, right? Those are the times when they get injured and they need the embrace. And we as fathers fail to do this. We think as pity is some sort of weakness. Let's see someone hurts themselves. Yeah, I wouldn't have done that because I would have done this instead. And this is how I prevent myself from doing that. Instead of just showing them pity. Being merciful. But see, we're all culpable, aren't we? If we're honest we're in front of the text and evaluate our lives, we are all depraved. We are all sinners and we're all in need of a gospel. There is no one who does not fall within these realms. Nobody in society. Someone is guilty at one point or another of one of these sins. And if you're guilty of one, guess what? You have violated the whole law. You stand condemned. Even if I lied only once in my whole lifetime, that's the only thing I ever did, guess what? I'm a sinner. It's just a fact. That's a biblical view of homotheology. Paul goes on to even worse. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they do not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. They know what's right. They know what God expects. They reject that. They suppress that. And they give approval to everybody who does it. We're falling in this realm, folks. The church is giving heartily approval to those who are committing out and out sin before God. And we have to stand for it. I remember hearing about a pastor just recently, well-known evangelical pastor, and he's not some radical whack in that, but I mean, his church is being referred to as the hater church, right? Because they stand on such issues. We're afraid of man and we don't want those labels, but if that's what comes, that's what comes. We still have to stand for the truth, do we not? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Turning from God leads inescapably down a trail into moral darkness. That's just the reality of it. The more that God is removed from the equation, the worse man is going to become. May God help us. But may we stand unashamed of the gospel and know that it is the power of God unto salvation. It can change and it can transform. And may we be found faithful in being those who are sharing this message with the lost and dying world. If we truly have any care for them or love for them, we will. We will. Let's pray.